In the recently published National Electricity Plan by the Central Electricity Authority, it mentions a unique project proposal. A 1150 km undersea power cable linking Paradeep in Odisha to Port Blair in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. In two phases, the high voltage direct current undersea cable of 500 MW capacity will be laid. The project is very important as India is developing a mega transshipment port at the Nicobar Islands. But even after considering the increased power demand, the total demand for electricity for the entire Bay of Bengal Islands remains less than 100 MW. Then why is the government laying 500 MW cables to the Nicobar Islands? And what's the bigger geopolitical strategy behind it? Let's discuss. Hello guys, I am Saurav and welcome to the Ark. The project aims to connect Andaman and Nicobar Islands with the mainland of the country through HVDC undersea power cables. It will be a plus minus 320 kV 250 MW HVDC voltage source converter interconnection between Paradeep in Odisha and Port Blair, the capital city of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands on southern Andaman Island. The total length of the undersea cable would be 1150 km. The estimated cost of the first phase of the project is around 31000 crore rupees and it is expected to be completed within the next 5 years. The capacity of the cable would be 500 MW considering future demands. In phase 2 of the project, another 250 MW HVDC terminal would be added at both Paradeep and Nicobar Islands along with undersea cable connection from Port Blair to Nicobar Islands. To meet the electricity demand of Nicobar Islands, it would be approximately 600 km long. But what's the sudden need of increased power demand of the Nicobar Islands? It's primarily because of India's plan to develop a mega transshipment hub at Galathia Bay in the Nicobar Islands. India is developing a transshipment port project at Galathia Bay in the Great Nicobar Island of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal. It will be called the International Container Transshipment Port or ICTP. The central government in September this year notified the International Transshipment Hub at Galathia Bay as a major port. India currently has 12 operational major ports controlled by the central government and another 200 non-major ones governed by the states with the Galathia Bay port becoming India's 13th major port. The port is planned to be built in four phases. The first phase of the project will be developed with an estimated cost of 18000 crore rupees which includes the construction of breakwaters dredging, reclamation, berths, storage areas, building and utilities, procurement and installation of equipment, and development of associated infrastructure. The first phase is set for completion in 2028, offering handling capacity of 4 million TUs. The port is strategically located about 40 nautical miles away from the east-west shipping route, and it lies outside the crowded Malacca Strait. Once operational, the ICTP will also attract large container ships with freight added to countries like Bangladesh and Myanmar among others that have been dependent on ports in Malaysia and Singapore. India currently doesn't have a transshipment port, which is why about 75% of India's transshipped cargo is handled at foreign ports with Colombo, Singapore and Port Klang in Malaysia handling over 85% of this cargo. Colombo port alone handles more than 50% of India's transshipped consignments. In a previous video I have discussed how India is developing a big transshipment port in Vizinjam in Kerala and how and why transshipment is done in great detail. Do check it out. The ICTP at Galathia Bay is expected to be fully developed by 2058. Upon completion of the port, it is expected to handle up to 16 million TEUs. A total of 44000 crore rupees will be invested in the project. Other projects planned around the transshipment port include an airport, a township and a power plant. So as the port operation start with future rise in industrial activities around the region, the power demand is going to rise significantly. However, experts suggest the demand for electricity in the entire Bay of Bengal Islands currently stands at less than 100 MW. On the other hand, there is hardly any scope for generation and transportation of huge amounts of power from Andaman and Nicobar Islands to the mainland then why is the government planning to lay power cables of capacity 5 times the current requirement 
Even if we consider the rise in power demand with development of the Galatia Bay port, it's not going to be more than twice the current demand in the future. Then what's the idea behind laying 500 megawatt cables from Paradip to Nicobar Islands? The idea is to go further than Nicobar. The big picture is to extend the subsea power cables up to Singapore. Recently, it was reported that Singapore has granted conditional approval to Sun Cable to import 1.75 gigawatts of low-carbon electricity from Australia to Singapore. So, a company named Sun Cable, owned by billionaire Mike Cannon Brooks, envisaged this ambitious plan of developing world's first intercontinental power grid to supply renewable energy from Australia to Asia. The project named Australia Asia Power Link aims to harness solar power from Australia's Northern Territory and transmit it via HVDC subsea cables measuring 4,300 kilometers to Singapore. It proposes to develop the world's largest renewable energy generation and battery storage facility in Australia's Northern Territory and deliver up to 6 gigawatts of 24-7 green electricity, 4 gigawatts to be supplied to Darwin in Australia and 1.75 gigawatts to be transmitted to Singapore. It will amount to about 15% of Singapore's electricity needs. Electricity demand in the Asia-Pacific is set to increase by 70% by 2040 and more than double by 2050. Singapore is looking to import about 6 gigawatts of low-carbon electricity by 2035. It has granted conditional licenses for 2 gigawatts of electricity imports from Indonesia as well as conditional approvals for 1.4 gigawatts from Indonesia, 1 gigawatt from Cambodia and 1.2 gigawatt from Vietnam. Singapore will also import up to 200 megawatt of renewable hydropower through a cross-border initiative called the Lao PDR Thailand Malaysia Singapore Power Integration Project. These are all parts of Singapore's plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Sun Cable says its $13.5 billion Australia Asia Powerlink project is going to be world's largest solar farm and battery storage infrastructure. Sun Cable also has plans for the next phase of development with Indonesia. Now, after the conditional approval to Sun Cable, the project could very well become reality in the near future. So, imagine electricity being transmitted via undersea cables for more than 4,000 kilometers. Currently, the world's longest subsea power cable link is between Denmark and the UK. The 765 km long onshore and subsea HVDC interconnector will allow up to 1.4 gigawatts of energy to move between the two countries. Built at a cost of $2.15 billion, the Viking link went online in December 2023. Now coming back to our discussion on the Paradip Nicobar Island subsea power link, what's the logic behind extending the power link up to Singapore? As you can see, the distance between Paradip and Port Blair is approximately 1,150 km and about 600 km more to Galatia Bay. So as per the current plan, government will lay cable measuring 1,750 km. Now can you guess the distance between the Nicobar Islands and Singapore? It is less than 1,300 km. So if government of India is already laying 1,750 km of cable, then why not extend it for another 1,300 km? Singapore and the Asia-Pacific's energy needs are growing and countries are planning to switch to renewable energy sources. Then does it not make sense for India to connect its electricity grid to this region, where India has significant economic and geopolitical interests? India laying 500 megawatt power cables to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands is part of that strategy. Also, linking the Andaman and Nicobar Islands to Singapore fits well with the India-sponsored One Sun, One World, One Grid initiative which seeks to build a multi-country grid so that solar energy can be transmitted anytime from the regions where the sun is shining to regions where it is not. The National Electricity Plan by the Central Electricity Authority also outlines that under the One Sun, One World, One Grid interconnection of Indian electricity grid with Singapore, UAE, Saudi Arabia, etc. are currently under discussion. It's still a long shot and it might take some time before it is actually implemented. But I think plans are in place to have an integrated Asian electricity grid and this could very well become the first step in that direction. Before concluding the video, I am leaving a question for the viewers. Why is high voltage DC is preferred over high voltage AC for longer overhead transmission and subsea cable transmission? 
do post your answers in the comment section and i'll see you with another video soon thank you